Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Docs. I'm delighted to have Michael Hudson joining us today. He'll be discussing how under a neoliberal shift from industrial to finance capitalism, today's most pressing economic conflict is not simply between labor and employers. It's a conflict in which rentier interests have the upper hand over labor, industry, and government together. This is the political economy in which the COVID-19 economic shock is playing out with dire consequences. Michael Hudson is a research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a research associate at the Levy Economics Institute of Bard College. A prolific author, Michael Hudson's latest book is And Forgive Them Their Debts, Lending, Foreclosure, and Redemption, From Bronze Age Finance to the Jubilee Year. Welcome, Michael. Good to be here, Lynn. Michael, it's been argued that every successful economy has been a mixed economy, where the public sector places checks and balances on private sector power, specifically on the financial sector's power to indebt society in ways that impoverish it. Yet this kind of role for the public sector is being vilified under finance capitalism. So what's your take on that? Well, ever since uh, the Bronze Age, you had uh, the temples and the palaces uh, providing uh, basic, uh, basic needs. Uh, because if you leave this to the private sector, then you're going to have a situation where uh, the private uh, supplier uh, has a chokehold on the economy and can say your money uh, or your life. Uh, uh, th there are certain things that uh, governments are supposed to uh, supply and which industrial capitalism wanted uh, government to supply because they didn't want employers or their employees to have to pay for them. These are a number of things. Governments obviously have to supply military defense. Uh, you can't leave that to uh, private people. But uh, also uh, uh, healthcare, for instance. Uh, the uh, Conservative Party in England uh, Benjamin Disraeli said, health is everything. Uh, we have to spend uh, on health and uh, you don't want to, in principle, uh, make money off crime. But in America, we're uh, privatizing the, uh, the penal system, the jail system. So you have uh, increasing pressure on government, on governors uh, to uh, arrest people, uh, put them in jail, especially on drug use, uh, where you can employ them at 10 cents an hour and uh, lease them out uh, to companies as uh, low-priced labor. Uh, but most of all, government is supposed to provide the infrastructure, the transportation, the communication, the telephone system. And the idea is that if you leave, like cable TV, to private suppliers, they're natural monopolies. The idea throughout history, from uh, classical Greece and Rome, medieval time to Europe, is that natural monopolies should be in the public domain because you don't want to provide opportunities for monopoly rent because uh, monopoly rent, like land rent and uh, uh, natural resource rent, is not ne a necessary cost of production. Uh, you want the necessary cost of production to be the uh, material costs and normal profit, because obviously you need people uh, to have uh, some incentive to do things. But uh, the incentive is supposed to be normal profit, not super profits, not just uh, a free lunch. Uh, and so if you let uh, uh, transportation become privatized, then it's, it's going to cost uh, the workforce much more money uh, to get to work and to get to get to a job. Uh, if you let uh, the oil industry be privatized, then uh, the uh, profits from the natural resource and that the patrimony of mineral rights, oil and gas, is all going to go uh, to the private financial sector, not to be used as the tax base. And if you have the land rent, uh, essentially, if the government, uh, for instance, in New York City, they spend let's say a billion dollars on the extending the Second Avenue subway line up uh, along the wealthy Upper East Side. Uh, that increased uh, land values for landlords 
by all by about twice the amount, by about $2 billion, because people now were closer to the subway station, they didn't have to walk, they had better transport. All of this increase in land uh, uh, prices could have uh, financed the uh, extension of the subway and still been able to lower the subway fares for the rest of New Yorkers. Instead, the, the city let the landlords keep all of the uh, gains in land value, and uh, they uh, just raised the income taxes and went into debt uh, to uh, pay, pay for the subway. So you, you have a privatization of wealth that is not created by landlords, not created by individuals. Certainly the oil companies don't create the oil in the ground, and the mining companies don't create the mineral resources. All of these things uh, are given away freely. Uh, the, Uni the United States let forestry logging companies and mining companies uh, get whatever they can take from the public domain for free instead of, uh, rent, of getting the results of this uh, publicly owned land to finance the bu public budget. Taxes in the United States could be vastly reduced if, uh, on wages and on profits if you would just uh, tax the unearned monopoly uh, rent, the, uh, the economic rent. Uh, that is not necessary for production. So uh, uh, if you look at what Adam Smith wrote, uh, John Stuart Mill, all of the classical economists said, this is how capitalism is going to evolve because if uh, the government doesn't have to levy an income or profit tax and just uh, the rent tax, then it's going to be a low cost economy. And uh, the more socialized and the more mixed an economy is, the lower the cost structure is going to be and the more competitive it will be. And so it will force other countries to uh, definancialize and to uh, free themselves from their rentier class, free themselves from their absentee landlord class, free themselves from uh, you know, the foreign mining class, and uh, essentially be uh, low-cost economies, uh, low-tax economies uh, uh, as a result. Well, uh, that, uh, that was their idea of a free market. And uh, the neoliberals have essentially tried to take control of the minds of uh, economic students and how people think about the economy to say, no, no, a free market is free to make as much as you want. A free market is free from taxation on rent. A free market is where you uh, let, it doesn't matter how you make your income. Anybody can just keep whatever they make, no matter how they make it, whether it's in predatory, exploitative uh, means or unexploitative means. So you've had a whole transformation of how populations understand how the economy works so that uh, they don't understand how to solve and uh, reindustrialize the economy, and they don't even understand how they're being painted into a financial debt corner as a result of debt deflation. Talk more about the aims of finance in this private sector, public sector, mixed economy. The financial sector uh, essentially is uh, the 1% uh, or the 10% that holds the rest of the economy in debt. The financial sector makes its money by uh, getting the rest of the economy in debt to itself uh, and making money off uh, asset price gains. Uh, uh, in the past, the financial sector made its money by getting interest. Uh, but now, uh, with uh, almost zero interest, what, what it's after for is capital gains, because capital gains basically are either untaxed or taxed at a very, very low rate. So uh, the financial sector essentially makes its money not by being part of the production and consumption economy, but by siphoning off as much money from the production and consumption economy as it can for real estate, for insurance, and uh, uh, for uh, debt service and uh, banking services. Uh, the insurance, of course, would include uh, the health insurance. The, uh, uh, the result is that Americans have to spend so much of their money now on uh, housing, up to 40, 40%, 43% of their income goes for housing as opposed to 25% back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. They have to pay uh, huge amounts for medical insurance. Uh, and uh, the taxes have been shifted off real estate, off uh, finance, onto labor uh, and, and industry. So uh, you have uh, America really being unable 
to revive its industry today because how, how can you uh, create uh, an export industry or even compete with foreigners when uh, you have to pay such high uh, housing costs, such high uh, medical insurance and health care costs uh, instead of the government taking over, such high uh, uh, debt service. Uh, if you got all of your uh, clothing and food and basic needs for nothing, you still couldn't compete with foreigners because of all of these uh, fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate costs. Now, the job of the government under industrial capitalism was all spelled out in the late 19th century in the United States. For instance, by Simon Patton, who was a, uh, the first professor of economics at the first business school, the Wharton School at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, Patton said that uh, public infrastructure was a fourth factor of production and the role of the government was to provide basic needs like healthcare, education, transportation, other uh, basic services at very low price so that you lower the cost of doing business, you lower the cost of living so that uh, uh, the private sector will be able to compete with foreign countries. Now, most countries now provide uh, free healthcare because if they didn't, then the employers and the labor would have to pay health care. Their uh, cost of production would be much higher. Uh, and America has not done that. America has the highest cost of production in the world, not because it's technologically inefficient. The technology is all available and there. The, the reason is all of these extra costs that are paid by labor and by employers that are borne by governments uh, in other countries. So uh, as long as essentially America's uh, dismantling the government, what you're dismantling is the basic means of subsidizing industrial production and manufacturing. And uh, that's what's left America in a high cost position and driven American industry abroad without any idea of uh, how to create a national economy that makes it profitable to invest in industry here. So um, most of the uh, American cost structure has nothing to do with the cost of production and therefore nothing to do with industry or industrial capitalism. It's all, uh, it's a fallback into a kind of post-medieval rentier economy. Michael, in the rentier economy, banks have allied with landlords and monopolists. So comment more on banks and monopolies. Banks have always been called the mother of trusts. Uh, back in the 19th century, you had uh, the great fortunes on Wall Street being made by creating the steel trust, the copper trust. Uh, the function of banks is to lend money to companies to uh, essentially create monopolies in the markets uh, that can control the prices and extract super profits, namely economic rent over and above the actual cost of production and normal profits. And when you have a, a trust, uh, a monopoly, uh, you, you can get monopoly rent over and above the normal uh, rate of profit and the functions uh, and uh, the bank said, well, look, we can work with companies to uh, let a few companies like uh, Carnegie take over the steel industry. Uh, you, you, you've had uh, agriculture, uh, uh, ag agribusiness in this country really turn into a trust with uh, two firms monopolizing all of the distribution of agricultural products. Uh, it goes all the uh, you, You've had essentially uh, Amazon uh, becoming a monopoly. You have the uh, in information technology sector. Uh, turning into a monopoly. And the function of uh, these monopolies is you, the reason their uh, stock prices are going up so much is because uh, they're setting the price without any anti-monopoly legislation, such as you had under the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, and then Teddy Roosevelt is a trust buster. Uh, you, essentially, uh, since the 1980s, you've not had any uh, anti-monopoly uh, prosecutions at all. So uh, the economy has been more and more concentrated in the hands of uh, a few large companies that have uh, been able to get the credit from the banks to uh, buy potential rivals 
uh, such as uh, Facebook has been buying its, its rivals. Uh, you have uh, the cable companies uh, as uh, rivals, so people's cable uh, rates continue to go up and up without any uh, uh, actual cost increase. Uh, you, you have a dissociation of price from the cost of production. Price is whatever the market will bear. There is no longer the reference to the cost of production, uh, and hence uh, profits is understood under industrial capitalism uh, as a rate of return on the, uh, the cost of production and the capital investment. Uh, you have essentially prices being dictated by a financially organized trustification and monopolization uh, of the economy, most conspicuously in the United States, of course. We should also note pharmaceutical monopolies. That's, that's the most obvious. Uh, and uh, when you have prices of uh, 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 drugs here so much higher than you have in Canada and other countries, uh, President Ger uh, George uh, W. Bush uh, said, we're not going to bargain with the firms. We're not going to have the, do uh, what every other country does, where the government gets to buy in bulk. The whole idea is if you buy in bulk, you get a, a low price. Uh, and uh, George Bush says, we're going to pay the retail price and then a little bit more because after all, they're his campaign contributors. Under uh, the Obamacare, you had a huge giveaway written, essentially written by the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, the people that Biden have uh, appointed as the uh, health uh, czars were the lobbyists and the heads of the pharmaceutical companies. So you're going to have a very vicious uh, 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 pharmaceutical monopoly squeezing uh, the population here. Already in Idaho, where uh, there's a very heavy uh, COVID uh, 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 issue, uh, people are now being put in jail for, med for medical deaths. If, if you can't pay the hospital, you can be arrested, put in jail, and then you die as everybody in jail gets uh, COVID. It's like a financial death star has hit America. And the death star isn't COVID itself. COVID's all over the world. Other countries have been able to cope. It's the financial death star that's uh, really killing people in the United States. So, Michael, how is it that industrial capitalism ended up in the stage you described, one of a pro-rentier, pro-finance capitalism? Well, nobody really expected uh, industrial capitalism to enter the stage we're in now, which is uh, finance capitalism. This was not a necessary stage uh, of uh, industrial capitalism because you think of a stage as a kind of natural evolution. Darwinian style, where the most efficient uh, stage uh, uh, or form uh, wins out. But what's happened is instead of evolution, you have a devolution. You have a move backwards. The whole idea of uh, uh, industrial capitalism, as explained from Adam Smith to David Ricardo to John Stuart Mill, to Marx, the whole idea was that the destiny of industrial capitalism was to get rid of the remnants of feudalism, to get rid of the landlord class, of economic rent, of natural resource rent, and the idea was to make everybody uh, ba basically only earn money in proportion to what they contributed to production. Industrial capitalism was supposed to clear away the whole overgrowth of uh, absentee landlordism, of uh, uh, unproductive credit or usury capital, and uh, that seemed to be happening by the late 19th century. Uh, in the field of finance, for instance, you had uh, German and uh, Central European industrial banking creating credit only to create new means of production, to build factories, to uh, uh, create a steel industry. Uh, the lower house of government throughout Europe, for instance, the House of Commons uh, over the House of Lords in Britain. Uh, in 1909, there was a constitutional showdown uh, in Britain where uh, they passed the, uh, a land tax law to sort of get rid of landlordism. And the House of Lords uh, vetoed it constitutional crisis for a whole year, and they passed a law that never again could the House of Lords, the upper house, veto a revenue bill from the House of Commons. Uh, in every uh, 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 country, the upper house of government w was created and uh, uh, run by the rentier interest, that is by the landlords 
in the wealthiest uh, interests. And uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, industrial capitalism was to push democratic reform in order to sort of uh, over, overthrow the old uh, uh, rentier class. World War I changed all that. Uh, since World War I, the rentier class uh, has begun to fight back. Uh, before World War I, you finally had the United States pass an income tax law uh, that really only 1% of the American population was liable for the income tax law because there was a cutoff point. You had to be fairly rich to pay the income, and most of the uh, uh, income of wealthy people was uh, from either rents or stocks or bonds, uh, financially or for, from loans. And uh, uh, after World War I, they ch uh, all of this was changed. Uh, uh, instead of taxing uh, real estate, instead of taxing the oil and gas industry, they were made pretty much uh, income tax exempt. Uh, you had a shift of tax onto labor and industry, and you had uh, industrial capitalism uh, lose out to finance capitalism, not as a step forward, but as a... Uh, uh, a lapse backward is the old post-feudal uh, landlord class and the financial class uh, fought back and sort of uh, took over uh, the development. And that was greatly increased in the 1980s with uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And since then, the whole uh, Western world has been characterized by really a kind of neoliberal, meaning uh, pro-financial, uh, pro pro-rentier. Uh, economy. And uh, the result is that uh, uh, we have a financial view of the world, not an industrial view of the world. Earlier in the conversation, you explained the financial sector essentially makes its money not by being part of the production and consumption economy, but by siphoning off as much money as it can from the production and consumption economy. So how is this unprecedented income and wealth that rentier interests have extracted from the real economy being redeployed? The 1% makes most of its money by lending money to the 99% and making the 99% pay debt service to itself. Uh, the 1% own most of the uh, uh, bo uh, bonds uh, of banks, meaning ownership of the banks, uh, and uh, they essentially uh, use uh, their income to buy more and more assets. They don't use their income to buy new uh, factories or to, to make new means of production. They may buy out a company and then they'll downsize the labor force, they'll wipe out uh, uh, the pension obligations, they'll dismantle the factory and turn it into uh, gentrified uh, housing. Uh, for instance, uh, New York City used to be a manufacturing city. What is now the Tribeca below Canal Street and the Wall Street area, uh, there used to be uh, low-cost electronic stores there, the dairy industry. Now all of these buildings have been torn down or closed down and turned into luxury loft apartments uh, for uh, the financial uh, pe people making uh, enormous uh, financial salaries uh, uh, to buy in driving out uh, the rest of the economies from New York uh, and paying very little money, uh, uh, very little taxes for this. So instead of the progressive taxation that you have um, under, say, President Eisenhower uh, in the 1950s, you have uh, essentially regressive taxation. You've, you've slashed the taxes on the upper incomes very low, and you've made most of the upper income money tax exempt. Uh, if you're uh, making money by financial speculation, you're, uh, you only have to pay 15% of your gains, not uh, the, the full income tax that used to be 90% of the gains. So essentially, you, you've shifted the taxes off speculators, off the 1% that makes its money by uh, uh, capital gains and stocks and bonds uh, and rising real estate prices. And uh, you, you've uh, uh, burdened uh, employers and employees uh, with, with it. And that's, uh, that's the legacy of debt deflation that's leading to an accelerating shrinkage uh, today without either political party making any uh, discussion of uh, uh, how this is occurring. And without the economics curriculum, 
even discussing debt. Almost all the uh, economic theories that have been sponsored by the business schools, the University of Chicago, Harvard, uh, they treat the economy uh, uh, as if it all operates on barter. Uh, they're only looking at current costs. They're not looking at the balance sheet uh, of the economy. They're not looking at uh, the uh, financial claims, the stocks, bonds, and loans, the whole superstructure of financial wealth that is extracting money from the economy, the whole way in which the gross national product and national income accounts are created are not uh, breaking out uh, these, uh, uh, the distinction between making money by industrial capitalism or making money by finance capitalism. And so the, uh, people are not even aware of why they're being more and more squeezed, why they're getting poor. Uh, the result is suicide rates are going up, uh, lifespans are shortening uh, for the lower incomes, because people are blaming themselves. The whole doctrine of personal responsibility means it, it's not the system that's making you poor, it's not finance, it's your responsibility to survive. And so people who believe this actually uh, look at themselves as failure, and uh, get very depressed and uh, go on antidepressants or sedatives, as we see with OxyContin, and uh, uh, end up uh, dying. Uh, that's what happened in, in, in Russia after the neoliberals uh, did their reforms in the 1990s. It's what happened in Greece after uh, the, uh, the Eurozone insisted on uh, 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 Greece paying the IMF. Uh, and they zeroed uh, the Eurozone for fraudulent debts uh, that were run up by uh, its uh, financial class. Uh, it's, it's something that's happening all over the world, uh, and yet it, this doesn't appear as an object lesson for countries to look at and say, do things really have to be this way? Is there really no alternative? Uh, and if you think there's no alternative, you're not going to look at all the alternatives you have. Uh, there's very little discussion of what China's doing. I mean, how did China pull ahead? It pulled ahead by very heavy government spending on building up buildings, on subsidizing real estate, and uh, in uh, paying for most of the costs of living and doing business that are privatized in the United States and have to be paid by employers. So uh, if, if, there's a reason why China uh, is uh, become the largest economy in the world overtaking the U.S. and there's no discussion of that. That's called, well, that's communism. We don't want that. Uh, and what it is, it's industrial capitalism. Uh, so industrial capitalism is now called communism. Uh, I mean, that's the irony of the whole thing. Uh, because that was where industrial capitalism was evolving towards, is uh, an attempt to minimize the cost of production and create an efficient economy. You published a book as a dictionary or guide to reality in an age of deception, titled J is for Junk Economics. And in the book you define that there is no alternative, or TINA, as the neoliberal principle that if one can censor awareness of policy alternatives to austerity, People will believe that poverty, inequality, and economic polarization are natural, not man-made. What else do pro-finance advocates mean in saying there is no alternative? Well, when Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative, and that was her uh, famous uh, quote, Tina, there is no alternative, what she meant is the uh, financial sector has put a debt charges into the economy saying there's no alternative if you want to avoid a breakdown. And the breakdown is, uh, right now, the economy is in a debt deflation. So much uh, uh, American uh, uh, industry is closing down because of debt. For instance, let's look at the, uh, what, the legacy of the coronavirus, which is only catalyzed and, uh, and accelerated uh, the debt deflation. Uh, imagine the restaurants, that are closed since last March, the uh, gyms, the bars, uh, they haven't done business, so they have not been paying, uh, paying rent, uh, and their employees have not been getting an income to pay their rent. So what's happened is uh, that, uh, let's say in January, everything is going to go back to normal, although they say here it's going to be 
uh, March or April. Well, the landlords are going to say, okay, uh, we haven't been collecting rent for the last year. Uh, now you're going to have to pay uh, uh, all this, uh, these rent arrears. Well, there is no way that a restaurant or a gym or a bar can pay a year's back rent and make enough profit to cover it. So they're going to say, why should we work for the landlord without getting any pennies for ourselves? We're just going to go out of business. And so the restaurants are closed down. This, again, is a reason for the stock market booming. If you close down the privately owned restaurants and the privately owned bars, this is going to let the big food chains come in and uh, take over the whole market, just like Amazon took over much of the market for uh, books and for uh, things that people buy, uh, the big restaurant chains will come in now that uh, uh, maybe 70% of the restaurants in New York City are expected to go out of business. That's all going to go out of business. So uh, the only way to avoid all of this is to uh, say, okay, we the government are, are suspending all of the debt service, all the taxes, and all the rents owed during the period when nobody can earn an income to pay. If you don't wipe out the arrears of the debt that have uh, uh, accumulated for the back rent, people running into, into debt in order to live while they're unemployed, running up their credit card rates, borrowing from the banks, uh, or borrowing against the house, if, uh, if you don't wipe out this debt, then uh, you're going to have uh, the economy shut down with debt deflation because there won't be any money to buy goods and services and there, uh, it'll be just an accelerating unemployment and a shrinkage of uh, markets. Now, when Margaret Thatcher said there's no alternative, uh, what she meant was, well, wait a minute, if you don't pay the debts to the banks, uh, uh, they'll have to lose money. The richest 1% have made a trillion dollars in, in gains since the uh, virus uh, uh, hit last uh, spring. They've made a killing. Uh, in the last 10 years, all of the growth in the American economy has accrued the top 5%. All the growth in GDP, gross domestic product, has accrued to the top 5%. It's, since uh, Obama took office, GDP for the 95% of the population has actually gone down. So, uh, and the banks are saying, well, wait a minute, we've made a lot of money. We don't want to have to lose any of it. If you write down the debts, we're just going to close up shop and uh, we'll pull out all of the connections of the economy and the banks will go under. Uh, they pretend that this is a crisis. Actually, this is uh, a great opportunity to save the economy. Uh, Sheila Baer said uh, in uh, 2009 that uh, the most badly run bank uh, and crooked bank was City, Citibank. Uh, she wanted to close it down and take it over by the FDIC. There was plenty of money in Citibank to pay all of the insured uh, depositors, uh, but then uh, she was overruled by Obama and uh, Tim Geithner, the lobbyist for uh, uh, Wall Street, who was connected to a city bank in a, uh, a shameful conflict of interest. And uh, uh, they, they didn't close it down. And Sheila Bear wrote in her uh, uh, biography about this, uh, it, she found out it was all about the bondholders. Uh, the 1% own, are the bondholders of the banks. And they're refusing. They would rather have the economy shut down and 10 million more people thrown into the street than lose a single dollar. Uh, all of this is what the classical Greeks called uh, wealth addiction, uh, the love of money. They said uh, uh, that the more money you have, the more addicted you are to get more and more. Now, the good thing about canceling the debts is that you cancel savings on the other side of the balance sheet. You, and the savings are all this immense amount of money that's accumulated by the rentier sector uh, since Obama took office, really, since, since the 2008 and 2009 crisis. And uh, you'd restore balance to the economy. You would restore the, uh, a much more equal distribution, not only of income, but of wealth by having other wealthy people bear the costs of the economy being shut down after the virus. Uh, the rentier sector 
opposes all of this. Uh, and in fact, uh, Biden has already said that because uh, of the huge uh, $8 trillion uh, giveaway to the financial sector by the Federal Reserve uh, under Trump, uh, we're going to have to balance the budget. The, the cities and states are near bankruptcy. In, in New York City, uh, the, they're talking about uh, cutting down uh, the subway uh, system to maybe only 40%. It'll be very crowded. You'll be risking your life to uh, uh, go uh, on it because of the virus. The uh, Washington subway system has been uh, closed down on weekends, and I think uh, uh, many stations have been closed down. Uh, you're going to have a breakdown of state and local finance because uh, the landlords are not able to pay the property tax. Uh, the cities and states are not getting the income tax because of the unemployment. You're going to have a spreading uh, financial crisis uh, and again, finance capital firms are going to be able to come in and it's much easier to make a billion dollars off a crisis than it is off a boom. Uh, most of the, of the big fortunes have all been made when the rest of the economy are in crisis because everybody's in distress. You can buy assets in distress prices. And uh, that's why the crisis that's coming to the United States is almost engineered by Wall Street is a grab bag. Uh, and it'll be a grab bag with how uh, they're expecting 50,000 uh, uh, New Yorkers to be homeless. They're going to be out on the street. Uh, where are they going to go? Uh, crime is already uh, rising here. Uh, it, you're having uh, a disaster, and it's a disaster that is welcomed by the government, uh, that is refusing to do any bailout for the cities and states, refusing any support of the infrastructure system, the transport system, that is only uh, providing money to support the stock and bondholders so that they don't lose money and to support the banks so that they remain uh, solvent without quantitative easing money creation, but without uh, uh, any attempt to uh, revive the industrial economy, the, uh, 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 the uh, restaurant owners, the uh, the few factories that re remain, the, uh, and of course the labor force. So what do you think is in store for the U.S., barring some sort of progressive change in U.S. political leadership? The donor class, mainly the financial class and the rentier class, uh, controls uh, uh, who's nominated for the presidency, and uh, their uh, campaign contributions determine who's uh, elected to Congress. And uh, so at the beginning of the uh, epidemic here, they said, well, uh, we can see that the economy's going to be uh, closed, you know, pretty much closed down. Uh, the first thing to do, uh, it's, it's okay to close down the economy. It's okay for people to be fired, but we want to make sure that the stock and bond and the bank uh, real estate market is supported. So uh, Donald Trump's, uh, the Republican plan created uh, $10 trillion, $2 trillion was given is, uh, just to the, uh, the population at large, and $8 trillion was put into the stock and bond and uh, real estate market. And so the result since the pandemic began is this is a wonderful victory for finance capitalism. This is the buying opportunity of a generation. You're going to have, in January, uh, 5 million uh, renters thrown out onto the streets. Uh, they're not able to pay the rents. You're going to have massive foreclosures. Venture capital companies are going to be able to come in and buy real estate just as cheaply as they were able to do uh, when uh, the junk mortgage crisis crashed in uh, 2009 and Obama uh, did, uh, did not write down the junk mortgages to the realistic value, but threw out 10 million families. Well, 10 million families are going to lose again, about 5 million renters, and a lot of uh, low-income uh, families who bought houses on mortgage but have lost their jobs or lost their income are going to be defaulting. So uh, the Biden administration is going to begin just where the Obama administration left off, with huge evictions that'll end, as in the case of uh, the Obama administration, most of the victims will be black and Hispanic, uh, lower income people. So you can say that uh, Biden is going to continue the anti-black, anti-Hispanic uh, uh, policies that uh, Obama pioneered so strongly, which makes it all the more amazing to me that uh, the blacks and Hispanics uh, 
supported uh, the Democrats in the election. It's like uh, identity politics has succeeded in blinding the population to the fact that, uh, that you can have uh, blacks and Hispanics in office uh, spending their time fighting viciously against the black and Hispanic voters who elected them. That's the irony of what's happening now, but it's uh, what's in store for the economy in uh, uh, just uh, one more month when the Biden administration comes over, the evictions begin, the foreclosures begin, uh, and uh, the, the medical debts are going to be uh, uh, increasing. And as the foreclosures begin and the medical deaths increase, how would you define a centrist position? In other words, what's a centrist? A centrist is somebody who looks at all problems as being marginal, uh, not structural, and so you can only have a little change. So a centrist is uh, a right-wing neoliberal supporter of the uh, financial sector, uh, uh, an implicitly uh, anti-labor and anti-industry. A centrist is someone who doesn't want any change in the system and just goes with the status quo uh, because they can't imagine that uh, the real, uh, every economy tends to polarize naturally between uh, wealthy people at the top and uh, uh, Im impoverishing the 99% at the bottom. And the centrist doesn't realize that. A centrist thinks that economies tend to move toward equality uh, and equilibrium. And the, re the reality is economies move towards disequilibrium, polarization, and then there's a crash. Polarization, and then there's a crash. But a centrist uh, says, don't do anything at all. So essentially, you should just stand aside and uh, let uh, Obama and uh, Biden and the rest uh, stand by while the financial sector monopolizes the economy and impoverishes it. Michael Hudson, thank you. Thanks for having me. And from Geneva, Switzerland, thank you for tuning into this episode of GPE News Talks.